Jesus and Jean's worship at the cottage, and we're glad to have you here this morning. Such a, such a beautiful, brisk morning here on the Mount It feels great. I think fall has fell officially. Well, we're glad to have you here this morning. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pinner, Bobby and Dawn Privet, who we're glad to have back today. Chuck and Karen Watkins, we're our whole team. We want to welcome you each and every one of you here today. Wow. We're going to, we're going to praise the Lord here with a couple of great old hymns here this morning. I'm kind of going back to my old roots and uh, this past week and I was going, okay, these will be, these will be fun. These are songs that we've sung before, but uh, are, are just great, 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 great old hymns. So uh, y'all ready to praise the Lord? Yes. All right, let's do it. Lead from 
Some folks we uh, want to pray for this morning. Uh, got a got a fairly long list, so I uh, want to get through these. Um, want to pray for Dustin Barrett. Uh, he's had uh, had four vertebrae uh, damage uh, in his back Friday night uh, in a football game, and this morning they found uh, eternal uh, internal bleeding. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. gosh, your son? No way! Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, definitely pray for Dustin. I want to remember our youngest daughter, Kaylin. Um, she has uh, three um, very, very close friends. Uh, Whitney Albert, that I want to pray for. Uh, she has pre, what they call Eclampsia. it, pre eclampsia. Mm -hmm. uh, she's pregnant, uh, and it's a condition that uh, is very dangerous. Uh, it comes from high blood pressure during the pregnancy. Uh, can be actually fatal to both the mother and, and the child. And so uh, she had to be. Um, admitted into the hospital to treat that. She has another friend, Ashley Malchris, whose husband uh, fell 30 feet from a deer stand and uh, literally broke his back. It was a compound fracture of the spine. And, uh, but fortunately, uh, he can move his legs. He's not paralyzed. Fractured his shoulder. Uh, uh, no no breed, uh, bleeding in the brain or anything like that, but it's going to be a a very, very long uh, process for him to, to come back. And then she has uh, one other, uh, her sister-in-law, uh, Caitlin's sister-in-law, uh, they found out that she was pregnant and found out the baby, uh, they didn't have a heartbeat baby and passed away. And so she had to go through the delivery process to, uh, to give birth to a stillborn. And so uh, I want to pray for them. All right. I want to continue to pray for the people in uh, Tennessee and North Carolina, South Georgia and Florida as they continue to, uh, to make headway through uh, after the results of, of two hurricane, major hurricanes. And so we want to continue to pray. Uh, Karen and Chuck uh, not feeling well today, so we just pray for their healing as well. Um, David and uh, Stephanie, Stephanie um, they, they are great friends of ours. They have a, a, a food truck here. It's called Oba. If you've never had their Brazilian barbecue, it's pretty good stuff. So, uh, mm -hmm. But they found uh, fa their father, Terry Jefferson, unresponsive last week, and they had to cancel. And uh, so he's been still in the hospital recovering and um, not exactly sure of all what's going on there, but they are having to spend time in the hospital and trying to work too. So we, we pray for their father, Terry Jefferson. Uh, this morning, and then Cat and John Lewis. Uh, there's a to the daughter. Uh, their mother passed away. Cat's mother, uh, Jan's first cousin. They were like sisters. Passed away last week, and so uh, we want to just remember them. Uh, then Brenda Penner, uh, just uh, um, uh, at uh, their house in Venice, flooded from the hurricane, and they're they're still trying to recover from that. Uh, Glad to have Bob and Janet uh, Seifer back today uh, from Florida, and uh, hope everything went well for you guys down there as well. And uh, let's see, uh, Ryan uh, Vallely, um has a 32-year-old having some heart issues. 
Um, Marsha Wilbur, our good friend Marsha Wilbur, and her husband Rick. Uh, he had to, Rick had to be taken yesterday. We've been praying for him for the last couple of weeks. And they actually moved his uh, gallbladder, but some green had set in because it took so long to diagnose what was going on. So uh, they have inserted a tube. They removed the gallbladder and try to insert a tube for some of the infection to, uh, to be removed. So Rick is going to be in the hospital for the next couple of days. So we want to pray for both uh, Marsha and, and Rick uh, as he recovers. And we pray for complete healing for him as well. Our good friend Tracy Eversall dealing with uh, some back issues, uh, probably looking at some surgery down the road, and so we just pray for her. Um, let's see, Julie Reese's uh, daughter-in-law's father, Daryl, uh, in end-stage cancer. Um, let's see, uh, Sandra's mom's pastor, Brother Lawrence, is still, uh, they're removing um, the adrenal glands, and they think that that's been the issue. He's had a tumor, they couldn't find it, and so they've been uh, doing some exploratory uh, work trying to find out what's going on. And so hopefully that will bring healing to him. I want to continue to pray for Tanya. It's Bonnie and Howard's daughter, just ongoing health issues. Uh, Kurt and Laura Mather, uh, glad to see you. Uh, so great morning with us. Uh, they're, they've been celebrating 59 years of marriage too, buddy. How about that? <laughs> Man, that's incredible. Yeah, they put up with each other all those years. I know. That's amazing. That's, amazing. <laughs> that's right. God does work there. I <laughs> want to pray for Donna, Donna Dulac and Kay Wiley and the loss of their husbands. And Donna lost a, a son um, from brain cancer and um, uh, her husband from COVID. And then, uh, of course, Kay Wiley, uh, Todd, uh, mm -hmm. passed away. And so we just pray for their their healing, and, and um, there our good friend Susan South, uh, just ongoing health issues. Want to continue to pray for John Beline's uh, uh, niece and nephew, Juanita. You know, Marklin passed away, we mentioned last week, and uh, want to pray for Kathy's sister, Pam, uh, and then Juanita, for sure, uh, is uh, having the heart issues is affecting the kidney thing that she has, right? The, 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 genetic kidney problem. Is, is that right? Yeah, she has, uh, I think she's had two transplants since childhood. Um, yeah. And she's rejecting the current kidney and yeah. has been on dialysis now for a while and they've taken her off the list because of the heart condition. So yeah. she'll get back on the list for that. Mm. So a genetic thing. Her sister also had yeah, her sister uh, died, died from that. Yeah. Money has made it. Amen. Um, pray God's hand on, on her as well. Uh, I want to continue to pray for Tori, waiting on a, a liver transplant. Uh, Maria Barbado, still dealing with uh, vertigo and still recovering from some back surgery. And so we uh, pray for her strengthening. Pam Bryan uh, from Atlanta Sightseeing, loss of hearing. Uh, has feels like things have stabled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Colleen Bradley, brother-in-law uh, Don, uh, is home from hospice and is, continues to do well. Glad to see Tony back. Uh, seems to recover from the uh, Rocky Top Syndrome. He was uh, suffering from that. Uh, as well as some of you other folks that uh, are back. With a smile on your face. Roll Tide. Okay. Go dogs. Go dogs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I want to pray for Ken Baxley. Um, he has uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Alexis, uh, severe allergic reaction to the COVID shots. Um, Tom and Shelley uh, Van Beers are out in California, our neighbors, that are, they're doing a, a memorial service November the 2nd for uh, his brother that passed away. Uh, Gina Stapleton, um, just some ongoing health issues there. Uh, so I want to continue to pray for Gina. Um, a friend of Tom's, Paul Pete, um, is in memory care. His wife was in another facility and passed away uh, about 10 days ago. And, and uh, so I want to continue to remember them. Some of the folks uh, struggling with the cancer issues, Grant Destin, he's 33. That's our good friend Terry Britt's son-in-law has lymphoma. Uh, Josiah and Lauren Mihawk. Um, um, He's back uh, to Houston for some further tests uh, and found a, a spot, I guess, on his chest. Uh, is that right? 
And then Scott Hancock, uh, prostate cancer, Jim's nephew, Kloss, has uh, pancreatic lung and liver cancer. Uh, Joy Pruitt, we continue to pray for her uh, lung and pancreatic cancer. Uh, John Ballard, still undergoing uh, some of the uh, cancer treatment there, back on the chemo. Uh, Adriana Lee, uh, Crystal and Mike's friend, has lung and, and spine cancer. And, um, and then we uh, pray for this little girl, seven-year-old Oakley. Uh, she had the heart of a 75-year-old, and they had to go in and put a dual-chamber pacemaker in her heart at seven years old to try to get her heart to function properly and so we want to continue to pray for Oakley and just pray that that surgery went well. It did go well. It did go, oh it did, okay great, <laughs> awesome. Oh right, um, I think that's it. Um, and then we have an unspoken request and okay. yes Wayne and Lisa have an unspoken and our children are somewhere north of the Arctic Circle so yes, we're praying that they get home safe. Amen. Oh, Traveling okay. mercies for the kids. Um, Not what Kelly's mom's Mary. Mary. Her name is Mary. Mary. She's got uh, congestive heart failure, pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, congestive heart failure. Right. And once again, we're glad to have Bobby and Dawn back. They were able to get away and have some downtime. And man, that's always good. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's pray together. Hi. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that we can still gather together as your children to come before you, to lift up our prayer requests, and to give you praise for who you are. Lord, we don't have to look far around us to recognize the majesty of your handiwork. And so, Father, in our moments together today, Father, help us to, to focus our minds and our hearts on you, on your word, and the power of your son's message that he gave us when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. We lift up every prayer request, Father, knowing that you go ahead of us in every situation, every trial that we face. And so, Father, we just pray your blessings on each and every one that we've lifted up today. God, help them to feel your presence in a very real and a very personal way. I pray that you would just reach down and give each one a holy hug, that they may feel you. Know that you are real. Know that they are loved with an everlasting love. We pray for our message today, Father. As I always ask, get me out of the way and let the power of your word ring through and ring true to our hearts and our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill us in such a way, Father, that you would change us from the inside out that we might be better prepared to engage the world around us, that they might be able to see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for each and every day that you give us to walk this side. Help us to uh, do a good job. We ask these blessings in the most powerful name, that of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, we are continuing our, our study of Matthew chapter 5, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. That's where the Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5. It actually runs through Matthew chapter 7. So we've got three chapters to study over the next few weeks, uh, at least till the end of the year. And uh, so we're excited about that. If you have your Bibles or your apps, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. And today we're going to be looking at uh, three verses. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 20. And one of the main points that I want you to understand about the Sermon on the Mount is this. Is that Jesus didn't stand on that hillside to give us a road map to the afterlife. He, he didn't give this message to punch our ticket so that we could be guaranteed that we were going to heaven. What he was doing, he was laying out a blueprint for living here and now. He spoke about bringing heaven down to earth, not as a, a distant dream, but a very present reality. It, it would be accomplished 
through our interactions with others, with the world around us, both friend and foe. And it's about loving our neighbors. It's about seeking justice and embracing humility. So far, Jesus has taught, taught us about the character traits that all kingdom citizens should, should possess. And he said, actually, that we're blessed when we apply what they call the Beatitudes. And again, remember, the Beatitudes are attitudes that we're supposed to be like. <laughs> and so was in, in we apply these Beatitudes to our, our daily lives. Jesus said, you'll be blessed when you do that. And next, Jesus told us that as Christ followers, we are to be salt and light to the world around us. It's our true calling to share the love of Christ Jesus with the whole world, not just with a select few. We are called to be the ones who add flavor and light or vision for those who are searching for what Paul called a more excellent way to live. In today's message, Jesus is speaking to the masses about part of his ultimate plan and purpose for coming to the earth. And he describes this first in verses 17 and 18. And again, I'm going to take more of an expository approach to teaching this. I'm going to use uh, the NIV translation, and then I'm going to contrast that with the message translation to give you a, a little clearer perspective on what, what Christ was actually saying. In verse 17 in the NIV, it says this. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. So Jesus begins this a long discussion about the law. He wanted to make it clear that he did not oppose what God had given Israel and what we call the Old Testament. Here's, I, I want to share some facts with you. This is kind of off the off the cuss a little bit, but the Old Testament contains over 300 references to the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus. Now that, when you just hear that, you know, that, that sounds pretty amazing. And so what, what chance did Jesus or any other man have of fulfilling these prophecies? Well, the mathematical laws of probability can give us a, a, a pretty good clue. In his book, uh, it's a book called Evidence That Demands a, a Verdict. Josh McDowell mentions the work uh, of the mathematician Peter, Peter Stoner. And he, he says on just eight, just eight of the 300 prophecies, this is what he said. He said, we find that the chance that any man, any person, might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth power. That would be one in one hundred quintillion. Now, folks, that's a lot of zeros. One in 100 quintillion. In order to help us comprehend this staggering probability, Stoner illustrates it by supposing that we take 10 to the 17th power worth of silver dollars and lay them on the face of the state of Texas. They will cover all of the state of Texas two feet deep. Now, mark one of these silver dollars and then stir the whole mess thoroughly all over the state. 
then blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say, this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? One in 100 quintillion. Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and then having them all come true in any one man. And Jesus... <clears throat> Jesus fulfilled all 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. And so Jesus did not come to destroy the word of God, but to free it up from the way that the Pharisees and the scribes had wrongly interpreted it. The Jews of Jesus' day referred to the scriptures in three different ways. They referred to it as the law, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. But the Pharisees, they developed what they called the Pharisaic law. The law that was given to Moses was called the Torah. It included the Ten Commandments along with other laws from the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And the Pharisees took the Torah and added to it their own laws. They developed a system of 613 laws. Now this is kind of, this was, the irony was just wearing me out on this. There are 365 negative laws. So you get a negative law for every day of the year. <laughs> so you get 365 negative laws and only 248 positive laws. And by the time that Christ came into the world, the religious leaders of the day had proposed this heartless, cold, and even arrogant brand of righteousness. And when they did that, it, it, what happened was is that the scriptures ended up, it contained at least Ten tragic flaws when man tries to put on what God has written, his own law. So let me share those ten with you right quick. The first flaw is that when new laws are continually needed to be invented, I mean, when new situations arrive, then you always have to put a new law with it. You have to write another law for a new situation that comes up. So that's the first flaw. Accountability to God, number two, is replaced by accountability to men. Number three, it reduces a person's ability to personally discern, to critically think through what God says as opposed to what man prescribes. It creates, number four, a judgmental spirit. We see that in everywhere we look. Church as well. Probably more in some churches than we do anywhere else. Number five, the Pharisees confused personal preferences with divine law. Number six, it produces inconsistencies. Number seven, it created a false standard of righteousness. So we see that again in, in a lot of churches today. If you act right, do right, say the right things, dress the right way, you can be part of the club. Number eight, it became a burden to the Jews. They were just worn out with it. Number nine, it was strictly external. It was all about what you look like. It was all about what I've been saying over the last several weeks about wearing the label of being a Christian as opposed to heart change. And then more importantly, number 10, it was absolutely rejected by Christ. 
In Matthew 23, verses 27 through 28, it says this. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, <laughs> what he called them, for you are like whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, oh man, you look good. Outwardly, you look like righteous people. But inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. The message translation from those verses of 17 and 18 says, Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, put it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Now I want you to get it. See, Jesus did not remove the Mosaic law, but he completed it by revealing himself in order to replace the authority of these man-made laws that had been put in place. And so instead of obeying the law, now it's about obeying Jesus. And that's why he was killed. They had more respect for the law than they did for the one who wrote it. For me, what I try to, to teach you each and every week is that the heart of being a Christ follower as opposed to just wearing the label is all about the heart. It's about the inside. It's, that's why I pray every Sunday, Lord, change us from the inside out. I, I tell you guys all the time, I'm educated beyond my level of obedience already. I, I know more than I do. And I, I, I pray, I tell you every Sunday, I pray, Lord Jesus, when I come over that mountain, have mercy on my soul. Because I believe I'll be held accountable for thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> it's following what Jesus teaches us. Jesus changed the law by raising the bar from the original intent of the law. And so now he can say, love your enemy. Now he can say, for, forgive those who curse you. He can now say that, that that lust of the heart is the same as adultery. He can say, love one another as I have loved you. And when Jesus says that, what, what happens is now these commandments are harder laws to follow than what existed before. It was great when all I had to do was dress up and clean up and walk outside and say, praise God, hallelujah. But now I'm being challenged to change on the inside, to love my enemy, to forgive those who curse. Now they're, they're harder than they were before to follow. Before it was all about that outward action or appearance of righteousness. And now Jesus says, I want to address what's happening on your inside. But what Jesus added when he gave us these commandments, he added his mercy. <clears throat> the bar, he's set pretty high now. 
The moral demands of God are impossible for man as he admitted. But he promised to do it with us. And so for God, nothing is impossible. He, he didn't make it easy. But he did promise to do the impossible with us. And here's the coolest thing that I love. I think the most about God because I know it's not in me. Is that when we fail... When we fall short, he doesn't come to condemn us, but to forgive us and to help us to choose correctly, to choose the right way. God is a God of an order. He's not a God of chaos. There is always a path to set right again, and that's his promise. That's why the Holy Spirit is so at work in our lives. When we get off track, the Holy Spirit is over here. I'm over here now. <laughs> Come back and join me. Let's travel together. But the main thing is that he did command us, he demanded us to choose to change. He wanted us to change from the inside out. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. Amen? Amen. Again, that's, that's why Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul gives us further instructions about how that change should take place. He said that we are to be a living sacrifice to God. Listen to what it says. He says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. He goes on to say in verse 2, he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Here's where the battle is, folks, right between your ears, that little six-inch spot right there. Some have bigger heads than others. <laughs> I say that humbly. <laughs> And then Paul closes out, he says, then, very powerful word, then, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know my saying, change the way you think, it will change the way you feel. Change the way you feel, it will change the way you act. Never seen that formula fail. Unless I get off track. Unless I choose my own way. Well, yeah, I know God just said that, but this is, you don't understand. You don't have any idea. You. And it takes a lot. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. And Jesus wanted to make clear that he had all the authority apart from the law and the law of Moses. But it's not in contradiction to the law. Jesus added nothing to the law except one thing that no man had ever added to the law, and that was his perfect obedience. Jesus never sinned. And so this is one way that Jesus fulfilled the law. Theologian D.A. Carson writes, Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets and they point to him and he is their fulfillment. Jesus fulfilled it in so many different ways. 
And then in verse 18, Jesus gives us this eternal truth. He says, For I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. I love the way the New King Jimmy uh, says it, the New King James Version. says, One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all of it is fulfilled. And the jot and the tittle were small marks in Hebrew writing. Jesus tells us that not only the ideas of, of, of God's word is important, but also the, the words, the letters themselves, even the letters of the words. The jot was like a little, little mark, was almost like a little apostrophe. The tittle was like the, the a crossing of a T or the tail on a Y that you see. And Jesus said, not one of those will be removed. Not one thing will change from the law. Heaven and earth can pass away. The stars are going to fade out. The earth is going to wear out. But God's word is going to last forever. Till all is fulfilled. It's the assurance that Jesus fulfilled the law by his perfect obedience. It's the assurance that Jesus himself fulfills the law in us, again, by his perfect obedience. It is his righteousness that is placed upon our lives. It's not our own. You can't be good enough. I've tried. It is his righteousness that is placed upon our lives the moment we accept him and believe him. Then in verses 19 and 20, the NIV reads this. It says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The message translation says, trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you will only have trivialized yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. So I want to break down these two verses. Verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. See, the commandments are to be obeyed as explained and fulfilled by Jesus' life and teaching, not by what the religious leaders wrote. Not as in the legalistic thinking of the religious authorities of Jesus' day. For example, Sacrifice is commanded by the law, but it was fulfilled in Jesus. So, again, today as Christ followers, we, we don't run the danger of being called the least in the kingdom of heaven by not observing animal sacrifice, as it was detailed in the law of Moses. Christ made the ultimate <gasps> sacrifice, and it was by his blood that the debt was paid so that the blood of animal sacrifices was no longer needed. Number two, it says, whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see that as Christ followers, again, we are done with the law as a means of gaining a righteous standard or standing before God. One, one passage that explains this is Galatians 2.21. Paul writes, For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You see, true repentance is moral and ethical to the core. When, when people asked John the baptizer what it meant to repent, 
He told them to share their goods with others, to feed the hungry, to be honest in business and be satisfied with your wages. That's how John the Baptist explained it. And the key word here is your willingness to do that. Hear me today. We cannot promise God that we will never use profanity. We cannot promise God that we will never be unkind or tell lies ever again. Much less promise to live exactly like Jesus Christ. We're not going to do that. We can't. But we can desire it with everything that's in us. We can desire, we can trust him to change us again from the inside out. Because if we can make ourselves right with God by just obeying the law, by just being good, then again Christ died for nothing. And what God is asking for is our willingness, not our ability. Because we don't have that. I can only do through Christ. And what is done for Christ is the only thing that lasts. Jesus goes on to say, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll tell you a quick story. A Sunday school teacher asked the, the children in his Sunday school class these questions. He said, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? No, the children screamed. Well, next, if I cleaned the church every day, if I mowed the yard and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? And again, the answer was a resounding no from these kids. Well, then, if I was kind to animals and I gave candy to all the children and I loved my wife and my kids, would, would that get me into heaven? And again, they all shouted, no! And finally ask him, he says, well, how can I get into heaven? And then this little five-year-old boy shouted out, you got to be dead. <laughs> well, he was close. <laughs> you got to be dead, but you got to be dead to yourself and alive in Christ. Yet when we consider the incredible devotion to the law shown by the scribes and the Pharisees, how can we ever hope to exceed their righteousness? I mean, the, the Pharisees were so scrupulous in their keeping of the law that they would even tithe from the small spices that they would get from their gardens, their herb gardens. But listen to what Jesus said about that in Matthew 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The heart of this kind of devotion to God is still shown by modern-day Orthodox Jews. Listen to this story. In 1992, tenants let three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn to the ground while they asked a rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath violated Jewish law. You see, observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath. Because doing so would break an electrical current, which is considered a form of work. In the half hour that it took the rabbi to decide yes, 
The fire spread to two neighboring apartments and burned them to the ground. In his renowned book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer worded it this way, it is Jesus himself who comes between the disciples and the law, not the law which comes between Jesus and the disciples. If there was anyone in the New Testament who displayed the righteousness of the Pharisee, it was Paul. Listen to what he says in Philippians 3. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. We can exceed their righteousness only because our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, because it's the kind of righteousness, again, that's applied to our lives. It's not the degree of righteousness. Paul describes these two kinds of righteousness in Philippians. He says, concerning the righteousness, which is a law, he said, I was blameless. I was a Hebrew of Hebrew. I was this, I was that. And then he goes on to say in, in verse 8 and 9, he says, but indeed I have all these things were gained to me. I have counted for loss for Christ. He said, indeed, I count all things lost that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the right righteousness which is from God by faith. And though the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was impressive to a human observation, it could not prevail before God. And that's what Jesus was trying to point out. So again, we are not made righteous by keeping the law. Isaiah 64, 6 prophesied this. He says, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And so the truth is that we are not made righteous by keeping the law. We're not legalists who are trying desperately to follow the rules. That's the picture of the scribes and Pharisees, and Jesus called them hypocrites. You see, these weren't mere suggestions that Jesus gave. These were commands. And yet, how often do we see these principles put into practice today? How often do we see them overshadowed by the pursuit of power and prestige and money as, as well as a, a ticket to paradise? As Eddie Money say, <laughs> I'll take two. <laughs> two tickets to paradise. <laughs> you see, it's, it's time to ask ourselves as Christ followers, in my opinion, some hard and difficult questions. Are we following Jesus because we genuinely believe in his teachings or are we just hedging our bets for a cushy spot in the hereafter? Are we living our faith or are we merely playing a game where the stakes are eternal? You see, the, the, the teachings of Jesus were never meant to be a spiritual lottery ticket. They were a call to action here and now, a plea to live a life of compassion, empathy, and selflessness. You see, if we're only in it for the heavenly jackpot, we'd miss the point entirely. 
So I want to challenge you this morning to, to take a moment to reflect. I mean, let's strip away all the celestial carrots that churches and pastors dangle, all the infernal candy sticks, and ask ourselves, what's really at the heart of my faith? What do I really believe? Are we living the teachings of Jesus? Or are we just chasing after some divine reward up there somewhere? You see, in the end, the answer to that question might be just the key that we need to understanding what Christianity is really all about. And it's not about pining for an afterlife. It's about embracing the sacred in every single day, right here, right now. It's the same challenge for many of our churches and their pastors today. Far too often, the, again, the church resembles the, the hypocritic teachings of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Too many of them use legalistic methods of teaching scripture to manipulate and or control their congregation rather than helping them to become more like Christ in their daily living. And in my opinion, that's why Christianity as it is taught today and in many of the churches has such a negative effect on people who are actually searching for Jesus. They, the, the lost are turned off by the hypocrisy, and the way that they're taught. So I, I told you, I, I come out of the Southern Baptist world, and you know, for a lot of us, we, we, we always love to clean our fish before we caught them. <laughs> And so if you act right, be right, do right, look right, you can, again, be in the club. <laughs> and I saw so many people, I worked in recovery for over 10 years as a director in recovery ministry, and I saw so many people struggle with accepting Christ because of the way the church was, not the way the recovery was working in there. So many make it more about following the rules than establishing a personal relationship with Christ. To let them know that God's not mad at them. There's not something about you that just ticks God off. He loves you with an everlasting love and underneath are his everlasting arms. He wants nothing but the best. And for me at least, and I hope for you, that, that's why the Sermon on the Mount has such power and purpose for us as Christ followers. The, the baton has been passed to us. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to be like Christ? Or are you going to be like the hypocrites? You get to choose. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much that your word is so powerful, that it rings through and true. Lord, clear our minds and our spirits and help us to read your word, study it in a way, especially this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught us because it really is a blueprint for living in the here and now of how we should be as Christ followers not just wearing the label. And help, help us to carry that love of Christ to the world around us, that again, that they might be able to see Jesus in us, and that we might be able to connect with people in, in such a way, Father, that they feel safe and comfortable to explore life change in the person of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you all for coming.